Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Chinese Corner. Um, my name is George, and I work at the Confucius Institute at Coventry University. And before we get into today's topic, I would like to spend a moment just reminding people of what we do at the Confucius Institute. Our role is very much focused on Chinese culture and language and trying to help people gain an awareness of the language and cultural background of China in general. So whether you are someone who is interested in studying Chinese or you your, or your business are interested in working with Chinese companies, we are available to help. If you have questions or you want to contact us, please um, use the links that I've put into the chat. So our email is confuciusinstitute at coventry.ac.uk or you can tweet us at confuciuscovuni. So in today's session, I'm very happy to welcome a good friend of the Confucius Institute, um, Mr. Liu Zhao. Um, Zhao has worked many times with the Confucius Institute before. He has shared his wisdom and his background and his his knowledge of studying in the UK and his awareness of Chinese culture. So um, welcome, Zhao. Hi there. Hi, thanks for uh, having me. So um, today, what are you going to be talking about? Um, so uh, today I'm going to be presenting about uh, Suzhou, a Chinese city, uh, which is also my hometown. Um, so I've got some uh, a lot of pictures um, about about the city. OK, fantastic. Would you like to begin? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, right. So. So the presentation uh, is going to be about some uh, 40 minutes and uh, there's a few short videos. So the city is named uh, Suzhou and uh, I was born in Suzhou and then uh, studying in the UK um, after I graduated in high school. Uh, but I'll give you more details. Um, so this is a talk uh, for the Chinese corner. And uh, yeah, so um, I'll just give you a quick look over uh, the things we're, we're talking about today. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about a little bit about myself. Um, and then uh, we're going to have an overview of the of the city. So uh, I'll give you some text so you'll you'll see like where it is and how big is it. Um, I'll also compare it with other cities in the UK, other other cities in like a world uh, known cities. Uh, and then um, I'll talk about the lifestyle in Suzhou. So I, I use three elements here, the gardens, the food and entertainment. And um, and then I'll move on to the produce of the city. Um, uh, finally, talking just a little touch over the education. So the city was kind of famous for uh, for uh, human talent uh, for for a lot of years, uh, for very long history. Um, so yeah, um, you can you can ask questions anytime throughout the uh, the presentation, um, and I'll be able to answer it um, promptly. Um, so yeah, um, I came to the UK after I graduated from a high school, which was like 2013, and I did. Um, automotive um, engineering bachelor degree uh, in Coventry University. Um, and then I moved on to a PhD uh, degree, um, which is I'm currently doing. And I'm a, I, th I think I'll, I'll graduate next year. Um, and uh, I was born in Suzhou. Um, in fact, um, my my grandpa was born in Suzhou as well. So it's like several generations. Um, and then um, Suzhou was a really big city, and I've been living in a central, uh, central uh, uh, city um, since I was born. And then now I'm still somewhere near the the, the central part of the city. And there's been huge changes to the city, um, and uh, a lot of the historic sites were were still there, but there's huge huge amount of change. All, uh, the, the living quality, everything um, changed dramatically over the years. Um, and uh, just a bit about by myself, I, I, I'm an engineer. I love um, technology, uh, swimming, and kayaking. Um, and uh, I used to work as a student scholar um, part time with the Confucius Institute. Um, and yeah, you, you can call me Z. Um, right. So an overview of of the city. Um, so Suzhou is a city um, located near to Shanghai. Uh, so on the right, you see a picture. Um, a picture. This shaded area is the area of Suzhou um, is pretty big. If you compare to Shanghai, um, it's actually a little bit bigger than Shanghai. So um, if you if you also look at a the map, there's a lot of water um, in the area of Suzhou and it, it actually shares this whole lake uh, with the neighboring city. 
Um, so Suzhou has a very long history, um, over 2,500 uh, 2, uh, years um, urban history. So at the very beginning, it was built as a, as a military hold um, because there's a lot of farmland around, around the city. Uh, and then it, it served as a, as a capital city for um, ancient kingdom. Um, so there is this number um, of, of, the, of, the, of the size of Suzhou. Uh, you probably don't have a very good idea, but we'll go to a slide that um, compared with other cities. Um, population um, over 10 million people in 2018. And again, we'll, we'll see more details later. Um, it's on the plain, and then there's no like there's no mountains. It's just a hill of height 342 meters, which is highest. Uh, there are several hills, and that that one was the highest. Um, and then um, in the context of the all other Chinese. Uh, Compared to all other Chinese cities, it was it was known for its calm lifestyle, um, beautiful private classic gardens uh, was th that were once private, and then uh, very good e economy, um, some uh, some really rich people, um, and then um, in the in the modern history, um, like over the past maybe fifty years, it was one of the uh, vanguards. It was it was one of the first cities um, to uh, in in, a, in China's modernization. Um, one of the reasons is that it's pretty close to Shanghai and it was very successful in attracting um, investments, foreign investment, and there's a lot of factories um, around uh, around Suzhou. Um, so um, I've put a table here to compare uh, the city of Suzhou to other cities. Now um, I'm just going to give you a little um, little overview. So this is Suzhou. And we have uh, we have Coventry here and we have London there. So this is the size. Now, as you can see, Suzhou is the is the biggest of all of them. Uh, what you see here is that this size X means um, Suzhou is 86 times larger than Coventry and five about five times um, the size of London. And when you move on to the population. Um, Suzhou has well, our, uh, Shanghai has most population, but in terms of like uh, compared to London and country, Suzhou has like dominant amount of population. But compared to considering the size, I think the density of population is prob probably the least um, of Suzhou. And then if you look at the GDP compared to other cities, Suzhou is um, I think it's the least. The GDP for country was not available when I uh, searched for it, uh, but uh, as you can see, it, it's actually it's even lower than uh, than Birmingham. Um, yeah, so I I think like from my perspective, it you know it it probably means that the city's got some potential. Maybe in twenty years it, it might exceed uh, Birmingham and it's somewhere below London, something like that. Um, but yeah, um, of of that size, um, the Suzhou, the city of Suzhou has a lot of error um, for water, and in the city itself. There's a lot of uh, lakes, rivers um, crossing the city. Uh, the urban area is about 32 percent of the whole um, whole 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 size you, you've seen. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to move on to uh, have a quick impression, the first impression of the city. Um, so here are some pictures. You can see a very diverse, uh, like a, like a diverse uh, things in these pictures. There are some modern architectures. Uh, there are some uh, classic gardens. Uh, now I'm just going to show a like shot video, um, and uh, um, it's about 1.5 minutes long. And there's a link here. And then uh, this video was on YouTube. I, I searched for it. I, I saw I saw this one it was a pretty good one. Um, I'm just switching to
so yeah, that was just like first impression of the Suzhou uh, city. Um, it was it was a drone shot by some um, uh, someone uh, who used to work in Suzhou, and he posted this uh, YouTube video. So uh, there's a link here. Um, so I'm just gonna move on. Uh, Uh, to briefly talk about the lifestyle in Suzhou. So I, I chose three elements, the gardens, the food and entertainment. So I'm going to show you some text. I'm going to read some text now and I'm going to give you some more details of each of them with some pictures. Um, so the gardens, these are um, the, the, the most famous features of the city. And most of the tourism are attracted by these gardens. So uh, these gardens have has a, has a long history over a thousand years. Um, in the city, of Suzhou, there are over a hundred gardens spare, uh, uh, across um, across the city, and then nine of them are recognized as UNESCO World Heritage. So, to give you an idea, um, in the UK there are 32 UNESCO World Heritages. Um, one of them, for example, is uh, the city of Edinburgh um, or the city of Bath, and they are recognized as a as World Heritage. Uh, uh, um, and they're um, kind of like a um, a very um, tourist attractive um, site for for uh, you know audience around the globe, and um, I, I used to grow up uh, near uh, one of the garden. I don't think it was UNESCO World Heritage, but uh, I used to go there every morning. Um, until like recently, they start to uh, uh, they started charge per visit, um, and it was nice. It was still uh, quiet. So uh, these gardens are built by uh, rich people. A lot of them were retired officials, and then uh, and then afterwards, these gardens were owned by different families. Um, and and I, until recently, they are now uh, like publicly available. So I don't think there are any, probably a few of them, but most of them are no longer probably owned. Um, and then uh, these, the garden, the design of these gardens has strong influence over um, many other Chinese gardens, um, including uh, the gardens in uh, the Forbidden, uh, Forbidden City. Um, and then um, there are like a, like a design um, and a construction in, in New York, in London, uh, with these Sujonis um, uh, garden um, 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 styles. And moving on to the food. So, uh, the local cuisine was was not like something famous nationwide, mostly because the the recipes are very simple and uh, the raw materials are very seasonal and locally sourced. So it, it's not very likely that the whole nation is going to have it. Um, for example, the vegetables they are very seasonal and usually locally sourced. Um, and then um, uh, the local uh, cuisine was light, non spicy. Uh, sometimes a little sweet. Um, I actually like hear many times I hear my friends um, having this con uh, conception that all the Sujonese food food were uh, were sweet, but it's not exactly true. Uh, just a, a small portion of them were uh, were a little sweet. And then there were local restaurants over uh, uh, that has like a few hundred years of history. Um, but just 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 as say not as um, popular as the trend cuisine, which is like spicy and hot, um, not as famous nationwide. Um, and then um, I think noodles was one of the thing that um, that only has a history over I don't know maybe a hundred years. Uh, these noodles are machine made. I'm going to show a picture later. Um, the local people loved it, and they are usually uh, topped with uh, dip, uh, like various seasonal toppings. And I'll, I'll, there's also a photo for that. Um, yeah, and then we got desserts made with rice and beans, um, uh, quite sweet. Uh, entertainment. So uh, Suzhou is also like famous for um, being the origin of this um, uh, most historic opera, Quan uh, Chu, which is a, a UNESCO intangible um, heritage, and it strongly influences the uh, Jing Opera, which is also a UNESCO intangible heritage. Uh, and then there are some uh, there are some other art forms that were um, that were done with local dialects and uh, musical instruments. So I'll show a picture later. Um, yeah, so, um, in, um, so so the first one is the gardens. Um, I'll give you some more details with this video. It's about like five minutes long. Um, so these gardens um, has very Asian history over a thousand years old, some of them. 
and uh, on the left you see a picture. All these um, golden uh, square dots are the UNESCO uh, World Heritage. Now you might see like these. Um, uh, there's a there's a clear sign of uh, like this this green uh, green um, surrounding. That was the that was a river. That was a man-made river uh, from the ancient time to protect this protect the old town, old city. And that was like eight out of nine uh, UNESCO World Heritage sites. So uh, I, I prepared a video here. It's also shot by a, a couple who was traveling around the world, and they shot this uh, fantastic video about um, Suzhou Gardens. Um, I'm not sure why it's paused. Uh, I'm not sure if the if the audio has come through. I'll, I'll just check. It hasn't. OK, uh, I'll just check. Um, Um, excuse me, just one minute. Uh, I'm just enabling the audio to come through. Um, there must be some settings here. I, um, All right, uh, sorry, actually, um, I'm going to play the video. I'm going to give you some um, explanatory um, comments. So this is one of the uh, one of the classic gardens. You can see a lot of plants. And this is one of the world heritage sites. So these gardens are considered as 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 pinnacle of all the Chinese gardens. Uh, whatever you see, it's been built a very long time ago, but it's been remodeled, um, upgraded over the years. So what you see now is the humble administrator's stuff. Uh, and the, uh, the person who built it was one of the hard uh, politicians. And once he retired, he um, had all his interest And that's one of the uh, article, that's one of the um, he wrote. This garden was one of the earliest, and it took about 16 years to. to and this is a model of it. So, all architectures, they're carefully designed and laid out um, in the limited space. And um, the, the, the philosophy is that um, every time you move to a window or move to a, a passageway, Every step you take, you see a different um, scenery. Um, there's, there's a lot of tourists. Um, uh, I'll just like um, move it over. To one of the one of the quiet place. This is somewhere like out of town, um, and it was also 
uh, design uh, by a retired official. So that's pretty much about the, the classical parts. Yeah, and I'll just move on to um, talk about the food. Um, yes, so what you see here is the noodles. On the left, you see uh, you see the noodle um, of, of Suzhou. Um, so the noodles are machine made. So, um, and, and it's not really, it's quite popular in Suzhou and in Shanghai, not, not really in other parts of, uh, uh, of, of China. They eat other kinds of noodles, but this is uh, something uh, unique to Suzhou. Um, and on the right, you see different kind of toppings. So, uh, I'll, 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 um, for example, this one, it's a slice of pork. Now, what you see here is this, this white part is, is literally fat. Um, but what's good about it is that, is that um, it's usually like um, uh, it's usually stored in a, in a refrigerator, and then um, before they serve you, they uh, they take it out from the refrigerator, so it, it tastes really good. Um, it, it doesn't look so good, but it, it, it tastes amazing. Um, and you have uh, duck there, uh, vegetables, mushrooms, and that was a chicken. Oh, sorry, that's that was a pork stick. Um, and reportedly, I, th I think in one of the competition, there, there was a report. There's a link here. There, there, there's there are reportedly 518 unique toppings. Um, most of, if you go to any some kind of franchise of uh, a noodle restaurant, you would see some I don't know maybe 30 unique toppings. Uh, but I didn't know there there were so many. Uh, most of the toppings are a lot of them are highly seasonal. For example, the crab. So you will be able to have the crab meat uh, during October, November, uh, and they don't serve the uh, at the other seasons. Um, and uh, uh, these noodle restaurants are all over the, all over the city. So I um, from my my uh, my home in, in Suzhou, I I just need to walk for five minutes. I'll be able to go to a, a noodle restaurant, and uh, um, uh, usually people have it for breakfast and lunch. Uh, not really for dinner. Um, so uh, here is a, a a more dedicated collection of food of Suzhou. So um, at the bottom there there are um, uh, the captions for each one of them. Um, so I'll I'll give you like a quick look of the most like famous ones. Uh, um, a is something that 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 is highly seasonal. And uh, I actually don't know how to read it, but uh, basically it's um, it's, it's a vegetable that groaning uh, groaning water, and uh, um, it's only available I think I think throughout uh, sometime in summer, and uh, I think I think it was summer my my, my memory, and we, you won't be able to have it in other seasons. So unless uh, unless you put it into a refrigerator, um, and the C is uh, C is the uh, the shrimps from rivers and lakes, uh, they are de-shelled and they taste really, really good. Um, and they're quite expensive as well. Um, and then uh, G is G is the fish. And it's like a lot of people actually know that because that's what the Suzhou uh, cuisine was famous for. It was called a squirrel shaped fish um, because the shape uh, the fish was carefully prepared and it looks like a squirrel. And it was uh, soaked with this. Um, it, it's I think it, it tastes like tomato, some tomato sauce. Um, but but it not not exactly is. Um, and yes, uh, that was something famous uh, in the city. Um, H is the um, the crabs, uh, the hairy crabs. These crabs are from the local uh, local lake. And uh, they because of the limited production in Suzhou. Um, uh, the, uh, they are really, really expensive. So I think I think it could be some some like fifteen pound per per crab. And I, I think if you if you imagine eating that in the UK, that would be something like a thirty or forty pound uh, cr uh, crab um, per per crab you're eating. Um, so that's quite a lot. Um, um, and then. 
uh, moving on. Uh, this is the entertainment um, of the city. So uh, this is something called Quenchu, Quenchu Opera. Uh, it, it's a uh, intangible um, world heritage. Um, it's got over 600 years history. And then on the right, I've got a video um, you can look at. Um, so it's got, it's got a caption there. Um, but because there isn't, um, uh, you don't have the audio. Um, I'm actually going to jump a few times, but you can use the link to get a better idea of it. Um, what you see is a very elegant form of, of art. Often regarded as elegant. The costumes are very well made. And they were singing uh, very poetic uh, scripts. Uh, so it was in uh, in the dialect. And uh, I'll think he did the cat. Yep, and that pretty much is it. Um, so uh, it was uh, originated in uh, in one of the uh, town. Uh, it's not exactly in the central city. Um, I, I think the rumor was that um, it was it was back then the uh, the dynasty uh, were not very happy with uh, the uh, this dynasty was the was a government. And uh, they start to criticize the government with the local dialect, so the, the officials cannot really understand what they're talking about, and that gradually becomes a form of opera. Uh, I'll give you another look over an, another type of entertainment which is also local and it's got about 400 years old uh 400 years history uh so this is some something called ping tan and it's it's basically musical uh storytelling um on the left the the instrument you see is called three string on the right you see uh what you see is a is, a, is something called pipa it's, it's basically a lute and uh it, there are several like different types of performance types and you can have a uh, solo duo and trill um, basically, it's a storytelling and it's a mixture of um, talking and a singing. And uh, uh, the stories they uh, they tell are uh, heroic, historic, judicial. Uh, so I, I've, I've actually been to one of the performance because my dad has a like, friend who is like a professional uh, performer. Uh, it was uh, it was totally different when you sit in front of them uh, um, or you just watch uh, on, on a TV channel. Uh, you got that sense of like a 
don't know, maybe maybe if you if you've ever went to a concert, you know, is there's a very large difference. And if, I think a lot of times, even though they're using the dialects, a lot of times I don't actually understand them, but I I I, I do get attracted by the style they're performing. So if you are actually going there, it's great to to see one of the one of the performers there, um, even if you don't understand what they're talking about. Um, so now moving on, uh, I'm just going to talk about the produce of the city. Um, I use the three examples here. Um, uh, none of them were like, a, you know, it's, it's all of them are having some um, ha have a like long history. Um, the first one is the tea. So this is the finest tea bars called called uh, Bi Luo Chun. Uh, the uh, a green tea and it's got limited production. So uh, the certified beet ocean only grows us at a certain region in Suzhou, and that makes it very, very expensive. Um, and it was known for its fruit aroma, delicate taste. Um, you can actually buy it from Amazon because I actually saw it on Amazon. I, I'm not sure if it's like very certified for its, um, you know, for where it, it was grown, but um, they can be quite expensive. Um, as far as I know, they could be some uh, two or three hundred pounds for 500, 500 grams. So that that's that's way more expensive than the, the tea you um, you might be having in the UK. Uh, then it was the silk and the sewing embroidery. Um, so Suzhou was known as the earliest place that uh, uh, that um, that produced silk. Um, and then with silk, uh, it there was an art form uh, called sewing embroidery. Uh, basically, you use silk, and and these embroidery are handcrafted um, to um, to give you something that you know looks like in that in that in that picture. So uh, these and they were usually done by ladies. As a um, at the very beginning, it was some kind of a leisure activity, but now uh, it becomes some kind of a uh, uh, an industry of of ladies who are still handcrafting these embroideries. Um, and it was uh, one of the intangible heritage of China. Um, finally, it was a crab from uh, the Yanshan Lake. So that's one of the lake that produces the finest crabs of the of the country, I think. Um, uh, the crabs are good because um, I, I think one of the one of the report I, I see was that it's not scientifically sound probably, um, but it, it says that uh, uh, the Yanshan Lake, the soil of that lake uh, was hotter and the, so that the crab uh, has to work, uh, you know, the, the crab develops better muscles compared to to other crabs going going growing somewhere else, and basically it, it makes the crab taste taste better, and the water quality is very good. Um, so it was famous nationwide. As I said, it was quite expensive, some twelve pound or fifteen pound per crab. Um, yes, and it's very seasonal. Um, the best season for the crabs are um, October, November. And maybe December. Yep. Um, so I I mentioned mentioned something here. The modern product uh, produces are the computer chips and a lot of um, high tech stuff. So that that was to do with uh, the government's uh, spending and investment, um, a foreign investment over these these technologies. Uh, so I think there there was a uh, chip manufacturing facility uh, for AMD. And for Intel as well um, in, in Suzhou. And I think now they're shifting a lot of resources to build health and digital technologies, um, um, uh, startups. And, and these, I think these uh, these companies would be, you know, you will start to hear about them in maybe the next 10 years, something like that. Um, so I think um, finally, I'm just going to talk about um, the education. So. The, the city of Suzhou was was also known for um, you know known for a place of of, of quality education. Um, in the ancient um, examination, um, uh, in the ancient examination, you know from from different dynasties, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of talents that were you know locally that, that were from Suzhou. Um, and they become some high up uh, government officials um, back to the old time. But even in, in modern days, uh, the Chinese um, Academy of National Academy of Engineering and Science, uh, there is like a very high proportion of them uh, were Sujonese. So 
uh, on the right, there were four pictures I, sh I actually took them from the internet. Um, so that was my high school. So as you can see, it was um, my high school has over 100 years old. Um, it was we uh, the high school was founded by um, a lady who was the wife of a um, local official and the lady built the high school uh, specifically for uh, for ladies to receive education back 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 then um, and then it becomes a mixed uh, mixed school. Um, so yeah, um, we used to have um, Chinese lessons on the grass. So we used to the, the whole class used to sit on the grass and listen to um, to to teachers. The teaching was was on on the uh, on the grass, um, and it was uh, the high school was named the most Chinese high school in China. Um, it's beautiful, um, and then um, I think even with like a lot of pressure uh, for the you know college entrance exam, we were still like having a lot of. Um, um, a lot of like a proper education time. It's not just schooling. Um, it was some proper education time um, in in this school. And yes, that uh, that's something I'm, I'm really proud of. Um, yes. Um, so that kind of concludes the whole um, uh, presentation of, of my hometown, Suzhou. Uh, I've actually prepared a few slides um, after this, but I'll just wait for uh, wait, wait to see if there's any um, questions coming in. Probably not. Um, um, I'll just. Oh, excuse me. So, so thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I do have obviously uh, like how you've talked a little about the the traditions and the the food. So my I guess my first question would be if if you were hosting someone, if, if I was going to come to Suzhou to visit, what would be the first places that you would take someone? Um, I think probably one of the uh, UNESCO, you know, heritage, one of the classical gardens that gives you like the first impression of the old Suzhou. And maybe after that, you know, for dinner, I'll take you somewhere, you know, modern. Uh, you, you see all those tall buildings and uh, um, like a diverse, a very diversified side of the of the city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, do you think that are there any major differences between um, so where where tourists would go and are there any sort of local tips for where, where what that local people would do or, or go instead of the the traditional tourist places? Uh, I think yes, there there, there are. Um, maybe one of them is called tire a uh, tiger heel. Uh, it's a good place of very long history. It, it, it is a known Tars place, but just not so, so many, um, I guess, like more known to the, more acknowledged by the local local people. Uh, like me and my grandma, we, we would go there quite often. Tiger Hill, very long history. Um, Tiger Hill. What's the Chinese name? Um, it's called Hu Qiu. Hu is, is the tiger. Qiu is a hill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it, yeah. OK, so I was going to mention, obviously, now we start to mention a little bit of the language. Yeah, I believe you mentioned a little bit about some the, the local language. So are there any examples of, of how the local Suzhou language is, is different from the more traditional Mandarin? Um, it's very different. It's actually regarded as one of the, I, I think, one of the hardest to understand local dialect. But uh, meanwhile, a lot of people regard it as a very soft and uh, a nice, nice ton. Um, so I think I, I think I, I can I can just practice, you know, to to, to talk a few sentences of in Sujonese and you you'll, you'll see the uh, how how it's like. Um, so I'll give you like a I'll talk about myself in Sujonese. Um, now, I, I got very little of that. I heard, I heard maybe Mingzi and Yingguo and a few, a few, <laughs> something about your, was that about your name and something about your, your living in England. But I think, yeah, that was quite, quite different from the Mandarin. Uh, yeah, that's quite different to Mandarin and it's quite close to Shanghainese. So 
the Sujonese and Shanghainese, they can understand each other. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I remember Shanghai being very difficult. We do have uh, one question coming in from the from the audience. Thank you very much. So are there any local or regional festivals unique to Suzhou or Jiangsu province? Um, I'm sure there is, um, but um, I couldn't, I, I won't be able to answer this qu question properly. Um, I'm sure there is. <laughs> so, um, on the on the theme then of so so local festivals, obviously, when when you're you're clear near to the water and the water plays a large part in 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 Suzhou culture. So, does that affect how you celebrate any of the traditional festivals? So, um, does that you know perhaps so Dragon Boat Festival? I imagine it would be very very popular with with the lake nearby. But are there other traditions yeah. that have come up with the way that you celebrate? With the water um, um <laughs> I, I think the 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 uh, uh the, the dragon um uh the dragon ball festival it was it was the perfect example I, every year there are like a big festival there are a lot of teams from different cities to to celebrate in in Sujo. um but about other festivals i um i cannot tell like a like a huge difference um <laughs> yep I, I might have to like Google each festival and and, and <laughs> get get a better memory of, of each of them. But yeah. Okay. So what then? I have to say, obviously, you've been living in or you live in outside of of China for for quite a few years, is my understanding now. So what do you miss most about um, your hometown? Would you say? Um, I think for me it was. It was the food, and it was also um, being able to, uh, you know, to have a calm walk along along the river, along the lake. That was something I, I really miss. Um, the food, I think, the food is a big part. You know, I I, I just want to wake up and go to a noodle place and and have some noodles. I, I've got to say that the, the noodle was a it was a proper topping, it was something like two pound or less than that. So it was it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did have a few weeks ago, we had uh, some of the bang bang mian noodles um, demonstrated to us. So I know that noodles are very popular all across all across China. Yeah. And I know you mentioned that noodles were quite new in some ways to Suzhou. So you said over the last hundred years, why why do you think that the noodles um, were, were quite seemingly quite late coming to Suzhou? Um, I'm not sure about that um, because Compared to other cities, especially a lot of not, like northern cities, the, the noodles in Suzhou was very, very simply made. It was it was literally you put in the ingredients and the machine made it uh, for you. Um, I don't know the historic reason for that, but I think the Suzhou needs they, they they just particularly love this type of noodle, or maybe it's because the toppings they found a way to combine the toppings which are like uh, seasonal, locally sourced with the noodles. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. I do. <clears throat> so, obviously, I want to go back a little bit. We've, we've talked a lot about Suzhou, but I did have um, uh, wanted to go back a little bit about, as you've mentioned, that you've been doing quite a bit of work over the past few years for with with the Confucius Institute. And would you mind uh, speaking a little bit about what you've done with with us, and why did you choose to to come, and why did you come and join with the institute to help share Chinese culture? Uh, right. Um, so I've um, so I've come across the Confucius Institute um, in my final year, and that was in 2017. Um, so back to then, uh, Confucius Institute would like to. Back to then, it was. Um, um, Confucius, there was an initiative in terms of uh, Belt and Road um, initiative. So the Confucius Institute were eager to uh, to tell people what uh, a, Belt, a Belt and Road initiative was, and then they were recruiting some student scholars to um, to kind of translate this this whole idea, this whole concept to all the English readers. Uh, and that was back to 2017. I joined the Confucius Institute. Um, and I personally, I, I feel like it was a great opportunity, you know, to to be part of the team too, uh, because I'm a Chinese. I, I've been here for a lot of years. I know this, 
you know, there's people who are eager to understand, uh, you know, what's happening in China, what's happening in Belt and Road, um, but we're not capable because of the language barrier and everything else. Um, so I was eager to be part of the team to to join a force to 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 kind of promote this kind of communication. Um, so uh, the work I've done uh, was um, we we had a, like a student team of five and we uh, we translated a lot of documents um, from Chinese. We didn't just translate. We actually uh, combine it, compile it into a into a proper uh, comprehensive report about Belt and Road Initiative. And we did several presentations to a lot of English audience and received quite positive um, review uh, for that. Um, sorry, Josh, you, you were muted. Yes, I am. I am muted. Sorry, I was going to suggest. Would you mind telling us and sharing a little bit more about your experience in Coventry and what do you say some of the largest differences or perhaps surprises from coming from a place like Suzhou and with the with the traditional Chinese the heritage there? What surprised you about um, UK and the UK culture? Um, I think that was like a. Like for me, it was an up and down experience. Um, the <laughs> first time I came to Coventry, um, you know, I think of it as like as a quite representative to the whole UK, but it is not. Um, so Coventry was 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 pretty. I think it was pretty new, or let's say because of the history of uh, of the walls and everything, a lot of things were rebuilt. So when I when I come to Coventry, I used to living um, uh, this area called I think it's called Stoke. It was down the road of the engineering building. And it wasn't it wasn't as new or it wasn't as um, as uh, the, the way I thought that the UK would be. Um, so I was a little bit disappointed back to then. Um, but then I I, uh, I had a year in um, I had a placement year, so I went to Darlington. Uh, it was a it was a northern northern England city, um, and I, I enjoyed a lot of like new experience of of, of this country. Um, and it's very, very different country in terms of like I think in terms of like the people, uh, the 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 um, uh, the places, the environment, how like beautiful, how people like to to do their gardening properly. For example, that was a really good example. Um, and I remember the first time I go to Darlington. Uh, there's there's no I think that it's only it's only English people there. I went to I went into this shopping mall and. Uh, uh, there was this. Um, I, I think there was a hygiene. Uh, there was this. this uh, there was this grandpa. He was obviously working some, at some hygiene work, and he he was really really polite. He he was just smiling to me as I was working walking up uh, the uh, the stairs. Um, so that was like the impression I get. Um, it was like very well educated people, very polite people, um, and I I think um, in terms of that country is a little bit different because um, a much more diversified um, group of people and uh, uh, slightly, you know, a lot of places were rebuilt. Um, and I think compared to Suzhou, I think one of the most dramatic thing was that the changes happening recently. Um, in Coventry, there, there are changes. For example, we're building a new engineering building, but I think in Suzhou, every time I go back like once a year and every time I go back home, I see a lot of new buildings, a lot of new infrastructures. Uh, that's one of the things most. Um, I, I think that's a like significant difference between, you know, the two, the, the, the two places. My memory back to high school of 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 the Suzhou city was totally um, not reliable anymore. Um, I think you're still you still muted. Officially, it seems to be going off on me. I was I was saying the from my memory in China, it was um, the the speed of change there is is massively impressive, and we've we've just just come through a new question there. Say so as a as a technical professional, do you intend to return to Suzhou or elsewhere in China, or do you plan to stay in the West after you have completed your PhD? Uh, you know that that question bothers me like uh, <laughs> for a very long time. Uh, sometimes I, I I couldn't sleep and I thought about that. 
Um, the biggest reason I wanted to go back, I wanted to go back to Suzhou was to stay close to my family. And the logic behind that was, you know, th th it was very bothering for me because um, um, my dad actually spent a lot of money to send me to the UK to live a proper life to, to you know, um, and uh, um, and now he, they are getting old and I couldn't be with them. That's one of the struggle I have. So that's a strong push for me to go back to Suzhou and be, you know, be in the distance that they can just call me and ask me to do things. Um, but another thing is that um, I've, I've I've been doing engineering. Um, I've built a lot of connections in the UK. I know how things work here. And back in China, it's going to be very, it's going to be systematically different. You know, how, how things work, how people, how communication between people work. So I, I'm really afraid uh, that I go back and I, I, I don't, you know, I, I might feel um, uncomfortable with things. Um, so that that gives me the, the the problem. So I've been doing research. I've been sending my um, my uh, my CVs to, for example, Ali. You know, Ali Alibaba. That's one of the yeah. Um, they've got this uh, this uh, this institute for research of advanced advanced stuff. Um, and I, I wrote them an email to to their department of, of autonomous driving, and something. You know, something unacceptable is that they never reply me. You know, it's okay that they don't like my CV, they, but they, they never reply me. And that's one of the examples. It's kind of frustrating. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I personally, at the moment, I think professionally speaking, I would I would prefer to stay in the West if I could contrib contribute anything. If not, um, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... Do you think that there are, again, obviously, as in your research, would you say that there are, are more opportunities in, in, in the West or, or in China for, for someone in your position? Um, I, I think this is th this question might be very situational and like, you know, uh, specific to, to the industry. Um, I think for engineering, I'm not sure about opportunities, but I think there's a higher standard already built in the West or in the UK. And that gives you like a faster start to do anything you want. And in China, it's it's a little bit different. In China, you get to use people. If, if you do have an organization, people work harder than the British. Um, they work more hours. And in the long term, and they also have more engineers. So in the long term, I think the opportunities and the growth will be in China. But in terms of like, uh, you know, work something like work-life balance or something like uh, like happiness of 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 work. No one would uh, would go to China. I, I that's my perspective. <laughs> that's um, a fascinating one. Well, thank you. Um, I think that's a good place for us to to start to wrap things up. Um, thank you very much for sharing everything about uh, Suzhou and again and your personal experiences at the end here. Um, so for the audience. We'll be continuing to have Chinese Corners and please follow us on our Twitter to, and keep up to date with what we'll be doing. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to get into con into touch with us, either through our email, our Facebook or our Twitter. And we'll finish with saying thank you again very much to Zaha for everything you've done for the Confucius Institute while you've been at Coventry and for, for sharing with us today. So. Thank you very much and we'll should we say goodbye okay thank you and thank you everyone um for watching this okay thank you very much goodbye bye